What's up guys, it's your favorite Cubic Coach. Welcome down to another professional golf swing analysis. We're gonna be analyzing Yuki Inamori, JPGA Tour player, uh, one of the most accurate players on the JPGA Tour player. So we're gonna talk about why he's so accurate. Also, we're gonna possibly talk about why he could possibly use some distance if he wants to compete out there with the big boys on the PGA Tour. So anyways, guys, let's go do this thing. So welcome back to the channel guys. If you guys are new here, Mike's OG Academy is all about golf instruction. So if you guys are looking to get better at your golf swing, you guys are trying to figure out ways to actually implement new motions into your swing and just get better in general, this is the channel for you. So if you guys haven't already, hit that little red subscribe button. You guys are gonna be notified every time we drop a video. So getting into the swing analysis, what are some macro ideas I want you guys to take home from this? Well, the first thing is we're gonna be talking about a stroke skiing conversation, right? What is stroke skiing? Well, it was invented by Mark Brody who basically came up with a new format of stats that allows us to better analyze why certain players are dominating, right? Because with the old stats, we found out that players like Tiger Woods or players who were really dominating, we couldn't really figure out why they were because traditional stats weren't really indicating that they should be dominating, right? So Mark Brody came around and came up with a better system to basically score people relative to the field as opposed to relative to traditional stats like fairways, accuracy, driving distance, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's going to be kind of the first macro point. Why do we see players that are the best players in the world on the PGA Tour tend to be the longer hitters that aren't relatively so accurate? What does hitting it long off the tee with some type of accuracy do for the rest of your gains throughout all the other facets of your game, right? So that'll be a major talking point. From there, we're gonna kind of shift into the golf swings. Yuki Inamori obviously is a very accurate player, but what could he do to get a little bit more distance to help him get more strokes gained total throughout his round in terms of ball striking, right? So anyways, let's go hop into this analysis, but before we get too far, I wanted to kind of talk about our upcoming seminar. So if you guys are new to this channel, you guys probably haven't heard, we're having a seminar in Nara, Japan. It's gonna be in June. It's gonna be at Granage Golf Club. It's such a beautiful track. If you guys haven't played there or want to go play there, go ahead and hit the link in the description. You guys are gonna be able to find the golf course's website and you guys can look at all the amenities, look at the golf course. It's a championship style golf course course and they actually had professional tournaments there in the past so the course is in prime shape very very difficult I actually have a course vlog if you guys want to see it'll be in the link in the description as well where I try my best to get around that course is pretty tough but anyways the seminar is going to be there it's called the Kiwi Shallow Series basically in Japan the traditional golf instructors don't think that the Japanese shallow at the golf club and they're just a little bit behind the times I would say in terms of what golf motions that we talk about here in America so the whole point of the series is to get the Japanese a little bit more educated and hopefully describe to them about the shallow swing elements that can really help them gain some distance and therefore get more strokes gained total right so anyways if you guys are interested in that seminar and you guys want to join it go ahead and click the link in below it'll be a Google Doc where you guys can go out and fill the rest of it all right guys so let's go hop into this analysis all right guys, so let's get into this analysis. So the first thing I wanna talk about is gonna be the strokes gain that we talked about. So again, all you really gotta understand with strokes gain is that the players who gain the most strokes throughout four rounds of golf on the PGA Tour are the players who have the best ball striking, right? We found that with the short game areas, you're not seeing people get a massive amount of gains on average with their short game. We see that a lot of the winners and a lot of the players who actually are playing really good are gaining a lot of their strokes in ball striking, right? Now, not to say that short, whoop, just knocked down the iPad. Not to say that short game has no benefit at all, right? Because there's also a lot of cases where players have been hitting the ball well for a while who get their strokes gained just a little bit better of putting and they go on to start winning like a couple tournaments in a row or something like that, right? So short game is always gonna be important, correct? But I would say for most aspiring professionals out there, as well as amateurs out there, you're gonna get a lot of your strokes gained through ball striking, not necessarily short game, okay? So keeping that in mind, if that was now kind of the premise, we know that we get the most strokes through ball striking, where do you wanna start, right? Well, it all starts off T. If you can put yourself somewhat in position, doesn't mean in the fairway, but just somewhat in position where you can still hit at the pin and you're really far down there, that starts adding up strokes after strokes after strokes. And you do that throughout four rounds, you're gonna start gaining a lot of strokes off the tee, right? So that being the case, we found for a lot of players that we would rather you be hitting it super, super far and relatively accurate, as opposed to a player who hits it shorter in the fairway every time but it's having six and seven irons in as opposed to wedges out of the rough, right? So keeping that in mind, that's how we use strokes gain to help out professional golfers as well as 
You can also do that for amateurs. It's a little bit tougher for amateurs, obviously, because we don't have as much data points gathered on them. But I would guarantee, based off the apps I've seen that have tracked some amateur scores, you're still seeing that at each handicap level, you're going to see the lower levels of those handicaps players are the longer ones out of those, okay? So let me kind of just break that down real quickly, and then we'll get into the swing. But let's just say you had a 20 to, let's say a range of handicap is like 10 to scratch, right? So 10 to 0. You're seeing that the scratch golfers, that are the best scratch golfers, are typically hitting it way past the 10 handicappers, right? And even inside the scratch golfer levels, the best scratch golfers are way longer than not so good scratch golfers, right? So I know that's a little bit confusing, but again, I think that that holds true. Go ahead and check out um, Decade Golf by Birdie Fire. They have a really good strokes game app where you can compare yourself against other professionals and then uh, top level amateurs. Uh, Mark Brody also has a strokes game app, which I'm not quite sure what it's called, but I'll try to find it and leave the link in the description to both those apps. But go check those apps out if you guys want to get a little bit more educated on strokes game. But yeah, so anyways, taking that kind of theory that we need to get people hitting it further. Let's go take a look at these two player swings and figure out where Yuki Inamori is losing some distance with his golf swing. So let's go hop in. All right guys, so we got Yuki Inamori on the right of the screen, then we got Johnny Ruiz on the left of the screen. If you guys aren't sure who Johnny is, Johnny is one of George Genkis' players, a really good player in his own right, plays on the web.com I believe right now, or plays on the mini tours for sure. Just great golf swing, I like a lot of what he does. Uh, if you guys wanna check out George Genkis as well, uh, he's one of the most popular golf instructors on Instagram in America, and I just think his golf swing method as well as his teaching style it's just one of the best out there. I think he does a really good job. So anyways, go check him out. It'll be a link in the description to his YouTube channel, George Genkis Golf. Give it a subscribe. Go watch the videos. You guys are going to get a bunch of great value from it. So let's hop into this. So we're going to be talking about a few main things, right? So basing off the strokes game, we obviously want to talk about power leaks, right? So let's go into kind of the pivot power leaks first. And when I'm talking pivot, I'm talking the backswing pivot. And then we're going to go into the downswing, right? We're going to Try to keep it pretty simple for you guys. I don't want to get too much in depth because I think some of the most recent analysis may be getting a little bit too technical for some of you guys out there, so we'll keep it pretty basic, right? So first thing in terms of pivot, right? We can see that Johnny Rez, if we kind of compare him to, let's say, a Sam Snead or like a Ben Hogan or kind of more of the classical golf swingers, his pivot looks more so like theirs, correct? Now, if we go take a look at Yuki Inamori, he kind of more so looks what I would say the Ledbetter era of pivot or backswing or more so kind of the Nick Faldo era, right? So that was more the era where everyone was trying to kind of shorten the backswing. They were trying to make everyone swing smoother, better tempo, and just hit more fairways to, so they can hit more greens, right? Now, based off our kind of discussion with, uh, with uh, strokes gained, we found that not to be the case, right? So how can we help a player like Yuki Inamori, who is very much probably set in his ways, with a traditional kind of teaching style, how can we get him his pivot a little bit more powerful so he can pick up some more yards? Well, the first thing is, I'm gonna get a player like Yuki Inamori to get a little bit more hip churn or hip depth, right? Just churning, simply churning the hips a little bit more in the backswing. Now, how can we allow a player like this to churn his hips more? Well, the first thing you gotta go target would be the knees. So his trail knee currently right now is kind of staying flexed in the backswing or staying bent, and that doesn't allow his hips to churn as much. So I want you guys to try something real quick. If you bend your knees and keep them locked and try to turn your hip this way backwards, right? It's gonna be really hard for you to actually turn those hips. So what I'd like to see a player do is kind of like Johnny, if we go take a look real quick, as he starts from transition, or uh, not transition, as he starts from setup, his knees are obviously flexed, right? If we go take a look at that trail knee, we can see that it's starting to extend, right? So we're not hyper extending the joint, right? We're not locking it in place, but we're definitely seeing some extension in that trail knee. Now from there, with the added benefit of having that lead knee kind of kick inwards like the classical swingers, we're seeing a lot more hip churn, right? Now why is that a power key? Well, it's a power key because when you have more hip churn, typically means you have more time to generate club head speed on the way down because you have more time to swing down or more room to swing down or a longer distance to get to the golf ball, right? Again, the longer distance you have to get to the golf ball, the more time you have to build up club head speed. Now, a second kind of power leak I would say in Yuki Inamori's golf swing is going to be the way his wrists are setting at the top of the swing. Now, traditionally, I think that radial hinge is a good thing, but it's been proven you can get, most players get radial hinge by extending this wrist, 
You can still get some radial hinge in your trail wrist, as well as a little bit in your lead wrist was getting a little bit more of a flatter wrist. Now I'm not saying you need to be actually in flexion at the top of the swing, but you could still be maybe a couple to 10 degrees in extension in that lead wrist and still get a good amount of radial hinge, but not, not to the point where you're extending this wrist, right? So when I see players get that a little bit too cupped at the top, I find that to typically be a power leak because most of the time they're gonna steep in the club on the way down and then their body's gonna have to react and they usually don't get the lowering and then up sequence correct, which is what we're about to talk about. So then they lose out on kind of some speed, right? So that would be the kind of the second main power leak. So in review with the pivot ideas, if Yuki Inamori can get a little bit more hip churn, he's gonna have more distance to generate speed. And then if he could get maybe wrist conditions a little bit better, a little bit more flatter, I think he's gonna have a little bit better club shaft transition or shallowing of the golf club. And he's gonna be able to basically make sure that he can use the body correctly. So let's hop down into kind of the downswing idea. So we're gonna draw a line on Yuki Inamori's top of the, basically his cap right here. And then we're gonna draw a line on Johnny's. So let's just quickly kind of take both these players down to lead arm parallel. And then we're gonna take Johnny as well. And we see a pretty massive difference here, right? Now disregarding the knee structure currently right now, let's just take a look at how much the head has dropped. Johnny's has dropped right around four to six inches. Yuki Inamori has hardly dropped at all. So why is that a power leak? Well, when you're dropping into the ground, what are you doing? Well, you're actually storing energy into the ground, which then in turn is gonna push an equal amount of energy up for, towards you, which then can allow you to explode up off the ground and kind of get something that we call parametric acceleration. You can kind of think about it as a catapulting action. Um, if you guys ever watched the medieval times, right, with the catapults, one object goes this way, the other object flies the opposite way, right? That little motion, that little lever right there helps you generate a tremendous amount of speed, which then in the golf swing means you can hit the ball pretty far if your obviously impact dynamics are good. So what we found with players that hit the ball really far is they do lower into the ground, right? Whether they do it on the backswing and stay there and then extend, or whether they get high and then lower and then extend, they usually have some type of lowering, correct? So keeping that in mind, the first transition idea I would change with a Yuki and Amori is I would get him lowering in transition, right? Now, does he have to lower as much as Johnny? Not necessarily, right? We're not trying to, we, we're not going into this equation saying that Yuki and Amori has to gain 60 yards to be able to be one of the best players, right? We're just going into it saying that if we can get him maybe 15 extra yards, he's going to be a lot better on because he's going to have shorter clubs into the holes. And he's going to hopefully start gaining more and more strokes that way, which hopefully will lead him to a little bit more money in his pocket, as well as possibly some wins out there in the JPGA. So we don't, we don't need to do a drastic change, right? But I would definitely get him lowering a little bit. Now, what are some other key elements that I see to kind of power leaks? Well, it has to do with the knee work in transition, right? Not only is he not obviously flexing his knees as much as Johnny is, as well as his chest, his knees are slightly working different as well. So we kind of go zoom in real quick. Let's just go take a look at Yuki's knees in transition, right? So he has that classic linear push in transition, right? So that trail knee is kicking inwards. This knee is kind of sliding forward a little bit and then his pelvis is kind of working this way as opposed to staying a little bit more underneath him like Johnny's. Now, why is that not a powerful move? Well, the main reason why it's not a powerful move is because if you ever try to, let's say, uppercut punch someone, you want to lower into the ground, keep the pelvis underneath you to support you as you push up and punch. If you get the pelvis sliding out underneath you or this way and your right shoulder gets far too far back this way, you're actually losing out on a lot of speed. It's not a very powerful move, but yet we've taught it in the golf instruction world for a long time, which doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But that's kind of the number one power link, I think, besides the lowering of the head in transition, that would be one of the more uh, power leaks right there. So what, is, what should he do differently? Well, I think in transition, he should be kind of modeling a little bit more Johnny's look. Now, does he have to give that trill knee as externally rotated as Johnny and that lead knee as externally rotated as Johnny? Not necessarily, right? Because it's the same thing with the lowering of the head idea. Do we need him to do it to the extremes? No, not really, right? But we need to do it. We need to get him to do it somewhat, right? So he can get a little bit more speed. So I would probably get that knee kicking in a little bit less. So right around lead arm parallel, I'd have instead of it pointing inwards, I'd be pointing pretty much straight out in front of him. And then his trill knee would be, or lead knee would be a little bit more externally rotated, right? We just get it just a tiny bit of change. Now from that position, we'd start seeing that the pelvis line would be in left pelvic tilt, right? Or the left side of the pelvis would be lower than the trill side. And that's gonna get that pelvis underneath him. 
to where now he's a little bit more supporting the spine as he starts to extend and punch. And let's go kind of see what Johnny does, right? So Johnny very much has that left side of the pelvis lower, right? So let's draw an arrow. And then from here, we're gonna see him have the pelvis underneath him and then it's very much supported as he pushes up and extends, right? So pretty much from position six, this is the lowest he's gonna get down here. Then he extends a little bit at impact, right? But not a lot. He's starting to extend pretty much right about here. And then you really see a massive amount of extension pretty much right around the hands, get level with the hips on the fall through. That's when you start seeing everything massively come out and extend, right? And that would be the correct sequencing of that little catapult move or parametric acceleration. And if we look at Yuki's, he has a little bit of that similar move right about here, correct? A very similar kind of move but he hasn't lowered as much as Johnny, so then again, he's not getting as much speed, right? And also, he's not getting as much de-loft as Johnny as well, so that means he's probably, probably not, if he's not de-lofting as much as Johnny, he's probably obviously not hitting it as far as Johnny as well, depending on club and speed. So anyways, guys, uh, those are the main power leagues of Yuki Inamori's golf swing. So for the Japanese out there that are watching, what are some take-home points for you guys? Do you need to do these motions to the extremes? No, right? You don't have to get so far away from your traditional model to where it feels really uncomfortable. I would start out with just doing it at small amounts. So at first, a lot of you guys out there who are staying pretty level with your head, just feel like you get a little bit of a lowering move, right? You don't have to feel like you get really, really low to the ground, but just start out with little motions, right? Get that head lowering a little bit more. If you're finding that you're sliding that pelvis forward and kicking that knee in quite a bit, do you have to go all the way to the opposite side of the extreme? No, right? Make sure that you try to start out with maybe just a little bit of that. Feel like you have a little bit less push forward. Feel like that pelvis is a little bit lower and feel like that knee hasn't kicked in as much. Start out with little small amounts and then work your way into the other model if you find like you want to. Or find a place down the road between those two models to where you think that you're in a better place, correct? And that would be my recommendation for a lot of the pros out there, Japanese pros that are watching this, as well as the Japanese just public in general that golfs. So guys, hopefully you found that insightful. I think uh, maybe it was hopefully an easier way to understand, an easier way to kind of digest the information. Um, typically, obviously, I use a lot of um, ter biomechanical terminology, right, with like extra rotation, flexion, all that good stuff. But I try to keep that a little bit more to the minimum on this one. So comment below. Let me know if you guys like these style of videos a little bit better, where I'm not as technical. Hopefully, you guys got some information from it. Um, from the people out there that are the haters, leave your hater comments. We love your hater comments. Just Keep leaving them below. Uh, everyone else, make sure to like this video, share this video to your friends if you guys found this valuable. Also subscribe to the channel if you guys haven't subscribed as ready. For everyone who wants to join our seminar, make sure to go ahead and click that Google link below. It's gonna go to a document where you guys can fill out and sign up for the seminar in Nara Japan. It's at Grandage Golf Club. Again, Kiwi Shallow Series, let's go. We got about roughly 50 of you guys signed up already and it's only been four days we've had it out so you guys are awesome i can't believe you guys are signing up so quick um by the time this video comes out too we might even already be sold out but hopefully if this video is out and we haven't sold out you guys sign up make sure to get your spot because again they're going really really quick so all right guys best of luck out there and uh talk to you guys soon